everyone. Welcome to the Court of Public Opinion. Now, if it's in the news, on your mind, close to your heart, getting up your nose or on your chest, it's on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the show where we shoot the breeze, we never shoot the messenger. Now, I want to thank Sarah Ferguson for running that story on Four Corners on Monday night. I have never been so angry in my life. I've read some letters to the editor and some comments by journalists and they're lukewarm. I'm talking about this story about 20,000 sheep that went from Western Australia to Bahrain and then they were somehow not allowed into Bahrain and then we sent them, we sent them to uh, Karachi in Pakistan where they were horribly slaughtered. You see, slaughter is not even a word that is, is strong enough to describe what happened. What is bleeding obvious? And I do mean bleeding obvious, because there was enough blood on that show on Monday night to convince every sensible, fair-minded, reasonably thinking Australian that we cannot have this insane trade of animals for which we are responsible under God and under law. We cannot be responsible for sending them into countries that behave like this. Now these are Middle Eastern countries and we know from previous experience, I think 60 Minutes and I think Four Corners obviously before did programs on the way in which cattle were treated in Indonesia and I've seen what sheep, how sheep are treated in Egypt. Now we can't allow this. I've heard every argument. It's a billion dollar trade. Well, look, I'm sure the heroin trade is a billion dollar trade, but we don't condone that. What is immoral is immoral. And I see in the Australian that we are contemplating, and this is where the court of public opinion is so important because we can change this. I see from the Australian story that we are contemplating sending a shipment of cattle to Egypt where they openly say, so desensitised are they, it would appear, to cruelty, they are going to cut the ears off the cattle because they're worried that there may be some sort of hormone implant in the ear. So they would allow these cattle with their ears cut off in that searing heat to wander around food lots, be attacked by flies in most incredible agony, and we call it trade. No, it's not trade. And uh, later, uh, when the jury joins us, we'll all hear what the people of Adelaide happen to think about it, because that is one of the stories, or one of the questions, we took out onto the streets, and we got some very interesting answers. Welcome to the show. Stay with us, but most importantly, care about that particular subject. I make no apology for ranting as I did a, a moment ago, because I think it is our moral and arguably our legal responsibility to see to it that we just have no truck with that trade. I, I remember Amanda Blair uh, gave me a spot on her afternoon show and she called it Enough is Enough. I think I'm going to borrow that and we'll have that sort of argument, that sort of subject as enough is enough. I think there are some things that kind of qualify in that area. Let me introduce you to Rhiannon Pilkington, who is a PhD. She's studying for her PhD. She's done some work on probably, you know, <laughs> arguably the major driver of ill health in our community. And this is uh, something that's affecting something like 75% of the workforce. 75% of the workforce. Rhiannon, it's about obesity. Hi, Jeremy. It is about obesity and overweight is coming into the picture more and more as well. And this is a combination or a, 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 um, a comparison between Generation X and the baby boomers. I know what a baby boomer is, I'm a baby boomer, but what is, who is Generation X? So Generation X are the following generation. So baby boomers get a lot of press and a lot of attention because they are our biggest generation. And Generation X is coming up next. So they were actually born from 1966 to 1980. Right, like a lot of those cars out there. <laughs> but okay, well, well, information was a lot more readily available for that generation than for my generation. 
Yeah, that's right. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is it's not individual factors or behaviours or education and things like that that are coming into play. In terms of obesity and overweight, if we think about it, our environment's changed a lot hmm. from when you were younger or my grandparents were younger. We used to have a life where physical activity was a part of what you would do every day. Yes. And the food was a lot different. It wasn't as processed. It wasn't as high sugar. Um, and it wasn't as readily available. Things have definitely changed from that now. Yeah, I, I remember my grandmother used to make us, Christopher, my brother and I, we used to have bread and dripping. <laughs> now, you can't tell me that we shouldn't, you know, we couldn't, we shouldn't have survived. I mean, bread and dripping. And we had, uh, for breakfast, we had bread and, do you know what bread and milk is? No, I do know what bread and dripping is. Though, bread and dripping, bread yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sounds terrible. I tell you, it tastes wonderful. Now, bread and milk is you cut up squares of stale bread, because we never would waste anything. You know, we came out of a fair, fairly deprived time. Absolutely. So you cut up the stale bread and you'd soak it in warm milk. Right. And that was breakfast for the kids. Mm -hmm. Now, that can't be good for you. No. Breakfast for the kids these days is a little bit different, though. Right. So... Bread and milk, when you think about it, aren't actually that bad for you. And the incidental effects on your weight over time, probably not very much. Whereas these days, most of the cereals we see kids having are terribly high in sugar yes. and not containing much else. I hear that the, it would be more nutritious to eat the packet that the cereal <laughs> came in than the cereal. Is that right? Oh, well, I hope I don't see that either. <laughs> Well, how big a problem is it when you compare this generation, the baby boomers, and the following generation? That's a huge slice of the population. Um, what, what is the bill? And who's going to pay for all of this? Billions and billions of dollars if and we talk about and, money. And we're not doing a thing about it? We're starting to. So the government has cotton onto this somewhat, and it's starting to invest in preventative health. So this is a really good first move. We're also looking at something... Um, in terms of the workplace and going into workplaces and using that as an environment to encourage better health and create more supportive environments for better health. Why do we have to be told all this? I mean, it's kind of nanny state stuff, isn't it? Why don't we just have some common sense and uh, you know, do a lot more exercise? And uh, I suppose we all want it in a pill, don't we? We want, we want the magic pill. The magic pill that will we, can, only, we yeah. can indulge ourselves and then we take the pill afterwards and then we're purged and forgiven and away we go again. Yeah, I think it's important to remember though that everyone's behaviours are really affected by their environment. So if you lived in a different environment and you worked in a different environment, your behaviours in relation to your weight are going to be different in most cases. And that's why we've seen this really large population increase in overweight and obesity. Okay, now in the court of public opinion, what do you want us to do? I mean, you've rang the alarm bell. It's a huge and very loud bell. Absolutely. Well, I want everyone to start thinking about it from a cultural perspective. What we see is acceptable and what we see as healthy really needs to shift. The health bill alone cannot be accommodated. 75% of the workforce you're talking about so we're not going to be fit enough to go to work. We've got to change. There has to be change. And we want to change the environment to make it easier for people to be healthier. Rhiannon Pilkington, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Great to have you on the show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is trust important to you when building life's biggest investment? Well, look no further than Rossdale Homes, a South Australian family-owned company whose mantra is, because trust is a must, has been building quality homes for people like you and me for over 30 years. Rossdale Homes guarantees an absolute fixed price. No hidden extra charges. Choose off the plan or work with their building consultants to design your own. Or visit their website, Rossdale Homes, because trust is a must. Scammels, South Australia's specialist estate auctioneers. Visit us at 7 Chapel Street, Norwood or at www.scammelauctions.com.au. I hope you're enjoying the show. Uh, next week, Alexander Downer will be a very special guest and the Jersey Boys, do join us for that. Can I introduce you to the jury? 
Julia O'Neill. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Caroline Peacock. Hello. Coralie Cheney. Hi, Jeremy. Now, we went out on the streets. Shannon actually went out, braved Rundle Mall, which is a great spot for getting public opinion. And we asked about three topics. The first one was this awful business of animal exports, live animal exports. Now, if you joined us at the beginning of the program, you'll know exactly what I think about that. This is what the people think. It's a, it's a tough, tough one to um, say yes or no, um, but it certainly has to be looked at um, more carefully. Once you've sold cattle overseas and they've gone to the ships, right, what, when they arrived at the other end of the country, in the other countries, what they do is their own business, right? Yes, uh, we, we can have our own slaughterhouses here that do the halal or the other forms, I guess, if there are other forms that will satisfy their um, cultural needs. Probably it would be better to be done at abattoirs here and then exported rather than in the live trade itself. I think that uh, it should be controlled and in a better system you have to put some procedure in place to get them so that animals don't suffer. It's just really, really cruel and if we can't guarantee the conditions of the animals, I think it should be, it should be banned. So Julian says ban live exports, it's cruel, inhumane and welfare is always put second to profit. Candice says ban live exports, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, etc. Julia, what do you think? Ban, ban, ban. It's absolutely disgusting what they're doing to those animals. Slash the throats, throw them in a pit, and then some of the people from the village go down, put a noose around their neck, drag them out while they're still breathing, yeah. and they have nerves running through their body. They're, if an animal is breathing, it, it's, it's feeling pain. And that was 24 hours later. It, these animals lay in pits. Totally abort it. I d disagree with it. Um, hate the fact that this is happening and why can't we we do something else in a hu more humane way why can't we okay they the people have to eat and they they love their meat why can't it be done in a more humane way why can't we educate sure. them to to do it in a more humane way they don't want to know why mm. because they say it's cultural Caroline well Times have changed from 100 years ago when the only way you could do a, an export of animals was a live export because you didn't have refrigeration. There is refrigeration now. If they want our meat, we should be able to have them slaughtered in humane conditions here and refrigerated and yep. sent overseas. That. Yeah, we can value add it. We can create jobs in our but country. They can be killed in the religious ways or the cultural ways that are deemed necessary, but in a humane fashion. Mm. Yes. Coralie? Mm, I think it's absolutely deplorable as well. But the problem is, whilst we could kill them in a halal way or according to their religious requirements, I don't know whether the refrigeration on arrival is there for the people and they do like to kill them fresh, so to speak. Mm. And we can't police it either, so we can't say to them, we'll send them over live, but you must kill them in this certain way, because they're not going to take any, you know... So it boils down to the fact we can't do it. So either we ban it completely, or we export them already slaughtered, yeah. humanely. I, I, I think public opinion will drive this government and the minister into that conclusion. I hope you know, so. I, I, I read the story this morning where uh, they were seriously saying, well, if we don't do it, somebody else will export the animals over there. I mean, this is exactly the same question about um, female genital mutilation. Mm. A, a doctor, I remember when I was on 2GB in 1972 or something, a doctor said to me, well, yes, I do that. I mutilate little girls because if I don't do it, some old hag with a rusty razor blade in an alley somewhere is going to do it, so I'll do it and do less damage. You can't argue that point. That's unbelievable. But then, Jeremy, unbelievable. like, let them get their sheep from somewhere else. At least it might... Pro Drop the price of lamb here. That's a good point. OK, all right. Now, let's move on before I get really angry. Yeah. Uh, foreign aid. Foreign aid. We went out and had a talk to you about foreign aid, and this is your verdict. Balance is good. Uh, you know, you've still got to provide to help the masses overseas, but uh, we still need to really help, uh, help the infrastructure in our backyard. Yeah, we've got, like, the resources to help others. Like, why not? I think we'd be a bit... Um short-sighted if we cut back on foreign aid? Personally, I think we should uh, show that we're a, a leading um, first world nation and provide 
um, foreign aid where possible. Help our own people first, yes. No, no, if we're helping people across the whole universe or the whole nation or the whole country and we've got a lot of abundance here where we, we have houses and we've got food to put on our tables, why shouldn't we actually go and help other people? And on Facebook, uh, Chris says, foreign aid, look after our own first. This is a very common thing. Everybody seems to say this. Look after our own first. We don't have to stop assisting other countries, but charity begins at home. Ken Leake says uh, charity begins at home, or at least it should. Carly? I suppose it does, but we are the lucky country. We are so blessed in this country. At the moment. And we should be considering others in other countries that aren't as, as well off. But I think it needs to be accountable and I think it needs to be in consideration of where that foreign aid goes because if it's going to countries where the diplomats um, are getting the money and it's not getting to the people where the need is, why are we sending out our money? It, so it needs to be accountable and it needs to be to countries that um, basically benefit from it and, and I'm sure it's given to some countries that it's not. Yeah, or the people. The people. The people how, do we, yeah. how do we get to the people get instead the people. of the, the politicians mm. maybe? Yes, well don't give it to militias. Give it to people um, through aid organisations who build wells for fresh water, health um, for children, but don't give it to just bureaucracies. Now I've got mm. a funny feeling that a lot of the aid ends up in Swiss bank accounts exactly. with tin pot despot dictators sitting in the south of France with both feet in a bucket of Bollinger. And how much goes to the aid itself of that money that people that we are yeah. giving to them? How much of it goes to actually helping them? Like the World uh, Vision or something like that. They the, have, you know, 70, 90% exactly. goes to the organisation as opposed to getting to the aid. Yeah, that's well, right. I'd, I'd like and to know. We, we, that's a whole different subject. We could do something on that. <laughs> you know, when, when, you, when you actually think about it, you know, the chief executives of some of this or, these organisations are making $500,000 a year before one cent gets to the cause for which the money was meant. Exactly. If you travel overseas, there's a UNICEF bag uh, handed around to everyone on the plane. Um, at the end of a flight and okay where does that money go that helps um, the people there but we really have um, infrastructure we don't have the infrastructure that some of the countries do have like China for instance and, and we really need help ourselves. and I think we need to keep the money here within our country and if it's a natural disaster sure help them out if it's a natural disaster but yeah. In general, you're I think a, we you're need You're a it. wonderful jury. Do we have time for another question or is, is that it? That's it. No. Well, we were going to do tattoos. You had some very interesting things to say about tattoos. So I think we might hold that over mm -hmm. uh, till next week. All right. The Court of Public Opinion. Jury, I, 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 I hate to say it, but you're dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> It's a home theatre. It's an office. It's a salon. It's a bar. It's a garage. Garage Mahal can transform your shed, carport, garage or undercroft into your favourite room in the house. You'll be surprised with what we can do with that disorganised messy space. Regardless of your reasons, your lifestyle or hobby, we can create whatever you can imagine. So call Garage Mahal today on 1300 839 353. Is trust important to you when building life's biggest investment? Well, look no further than Rossdale Homes, a South Australian family-owned company whose mantra is, because trust is a must, has been building quality homes for people like you and me for over 30 years. Rossdale Homes guarantees an absolute fixed price. No hidden extra charges. Choose off the plan or work with their building consultants to design your own. Or visit their website, Rossdale Homes, because trust is a must. The Court of Public Opinion, and I, I tell you what, I am delighted to have as a very, very special guest, a legend, a man that I've admired in radio and uh, the community for a long time, Mr. Bob Francis. Sir, 
Are you well? <laughs> Fine, thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. Now, uh, we're going to have a chat in a minute, but uh, this now, is the chair I was telling you Yeah, about. a lovely chair. I just said a moment ago, I'm standing up again, I'm going to fall over a second. The Lord Chief <laughs> Justice's Chair of the High Court of England. And Bob Francis is a, a, a very um, good tenant to have in such a chair. <laughs> now, this, this is the, the segment where I ask a special guest for 60 seconds to change the world. How would you change the world or Adelaide or South Australia or Australia? Can I sit? Oh, absolutely. Oh, right. ah, that's uh, are you ready for your 60 second burst? Okay, yes, You know, there's a man I've admired very much in this world, and that's a guy called Lee Kuan Yew, who ran Singapore for many years. I think his son runs the country now. If anybody has had discipline in the world uh, with his people, it's that man. And I wish I could have that control right here in Australia, to be the Lee Kuan Yew of Australia, to bring back discipline, to bring back uh, capital punishment, to bring back corporal punishment, to make teachers have control of the classrooms, parents to be in charge, kids. We are growing a ch children's society today of a lot of them not caring about other people's properties, not people caring about their own person. And the fact is, it's getting worse and worse, not getting better and better. So in, uh, in that just a minute to tell you that give me the chance to change the world and I'll change the world by bringing in more discipline in this bloody country. I couldn't agree with you more. I'm glad. You know, I was worried about it when I was talking about it, thinking about no. it. You know, was that, but I, I think a lot of people, I really do believe the majority of people agree with me. Yeah, but Lee Kuan Yew uh, was a benevolent dictator. Oh, absolutely. You see, I could never do the radio program in Singapore that I do because I wouldn't be able to can his, his, his government. But the fact is, I'm quite happy. I'd be quite happy to go and live there and do what he says. Yeah. Because yeah. I like discipline. Mr. Bob Francis, my God, I do... Relax, don't be nervous. No, sure. I just love <laughs> a professional. You know, people who make the difficult look so easy, and you've done that for so long. How many years? Uh, this will be my 57th year doing radio, so it was, it was, it was early 1957 that I started. I started in radio yeah. before television, and I, when I tell the yeah. kids that, they go, what do you mean before television? <laughs> I started when the lights used to go out in the streets at midnight. Mm. Radio finished at 11.15 at night and started at 5.30 the following morning when the engineer came in to dial Off a the telephone. Off the transmitter. Off <laughs> the transmitter. And he'd start the transmitter again. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And you had to sort of play God Save the Queen or there was a closing ceremony. Yeah, well, that night there was a prayer. Yes. Reverend Ch Lance Shilton would come in from a church in town and we'd have a, a tonight's prayer and a, a, a little religious piece of music. Yes. And uh, amen. Yeah, and, and, and was this kind of little, I, I don't know, it was Fat Cat or uh, Humphrey B. Bear, but uh, there was something that happened at about 7.30 or 8 o'clock on television, and maybe even on radio, I don't know. Well, and it was they, Fat Cat who went, it's time to go to bed now. Time you know? to go yeah, to bed. Yeah, and on radio, it was Keith Smith yeah. uh, with the kids who'd say, right, time to brush your teeth, mm. kiss mummy and dad, and off to bed. And he, he, <laughs> he would, under his breath, they call them little buggers. That's right. And he managed to get away with it for years and years and years. Yeah. yeah. What you were saying about Lee Kuan Yew, uh, it is, it's, it's fascinating because he was a, a society that came out of nothing. I mean, they had no water. They had to reclaim all the land. Nothing. Uh, he went the full gamut from being a, a, a communist uh, to a socialist. Uh, to finally a nationalist. Yeah, and, and to call him a benevolent di dictator is, yeah. is, is exactly, exactly right. But what happens after he dies? You know, you've got to hope that the kid or the well, son... Well, his or son the... is doing a fantastic job, you know, and, and what they're doing to Singapore at the moment is just absolutely brilliant. It's a, it's a beautiful country, it's so small, yet financially it's doing mm. so damn yeah. well. And it's safe. Absolutely. You can walk through Singapore any time, yeah, day or night. There's no it's graffiti, fine. there's, there's no. nothing. And, I, and I, I wish we could change that world to be like it was back in the 50s here in Adelaide. Hmm. People are being given too much freedom to do what they like and get away with it. The do-gooders of this world are giving me the shits. Everything they say is cause and effect. 
I mean, we can't grumble about the graffiti and we can't grumble about the lawlessness and the shootings and the stabbings because we have gone some way down that track to create that problem. Oh, absolutely, a absolutely. And, and, the, and the government is the first one to blame. They're the people who make the decisions on all these things. They make the laws. Maybe we've got too many lawyers making laws mm. in this country. There's, there's not enough just general, everyday common sense to our laws, to our traffic, to whatever has to be done. So why wouldn't you uh, want to be a politician? I mean, you could do that as well as the nighttime show. You would have no trouble doing It'd that. It would bore the living daylights out of me, uh, Jeremy. It really would. I, I couldn't stand... You know, it, it's hard enough talking to some of the, the dickheads that I have to talk to on radio, <laughs> let alone the dickheads I'd have to talk to personally mm. and spend a hell of a lot more time with mm. to discuss their problems because mm. I think politicians work pretty hard. They, they do spend a lot of time, but they spend a lot of time with people who mean nothing to changing society. And these people have all the problems in the world. We need a whole new system, that, a, a set-up system that looks after the, the, the problems with, with mental care and all that sort of stuff, with hospital care, with all that sort of stuff. Everything down one line and the rest to look after the country the way mm. we should be going. How's the book going? Oh, beautifully. I mean, Adelaide, I don't know that Adelaide sells a lot of books. I think we ordered a, f a first batch of 3,500 and uh, we've sold almost all those. And it was a number one seller. And, uh, you know, it, it means it's another little notch in my, my list of things that I've done in my life. You know, I've written a book. I wrote it specifically because people have impressions of what they think about me. And therefore, I thought, oh, well, I'll tell everybody what I am and who I am. And then if you have an, a, an opinion of me, you can kiss my ass. So that's the title of the book. <laughs> Did they argue about the title? Did they? They. What I've got changed? a feeling I might have been able to sell a hell of a lot more books if it wasn't if it wasn't titled that. But mm. it's done. It's finished, and and that's what it's all about. Would you have been a gentler soul in a different time? No, no, I wouldn't have done anything different whatsoever. I had a very lucky upbringing. I, my, you know, my parents never hurt me, never hit me. My mum and dad never argued. Dad never got smashed out of his mind. He never did the wrong thing. He was a colonel of the British Army. Uh, I've, I've had it pretty easy all my life. And so therefore I'm hoping that what I'm doing, what I learned at school by kids calling me Farouk and Sphinx because I was born in Egypt <laughs> was enough to give mm. me the, the chance to be able to come back at people when I want to, as I want to. Well, long may your program reign and congratulations on your ratings. Thank and you, Jeremy. Ten years, number one. Yeah. Ten years, number one. Don't get bored I'm with that. I'm 73. <laughs> Ten years, number one. <laughs> the legendary <laughs> Thank Bob you. Francis. Thank you. I don't know where the time goes. Uh, next week, the Jersey Boys, Alexander Downer, and of course you in the Court of Public Opinion. Now, just before we go, uh, Sax, come in, come in here. Sax, who Ooh. works and does bits and pieces for me on the show. I just wanted to plug his great show, theater production at the Arts Theater. Uh, it's called The Unexpected Guest. I went there and I, I was just knocked out. I thought you were a great talent. I didn't know that you could act like that. No, I didn't, did you? No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I'm glad you liked it. And you yeah. remember all the lines, and it's not like a movie where you can go and do takes and, and step backwards and forwards and do it again. But yeah, and it's a lot different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's on for another... Uh, uh, until Saturday. There might be some tickets uh, for the matinee on Saturday left, but it's pretty much all sold out. So all right. Friday, okay. Saturday. Well, I'm proud of you. I really am. Thank you for watching. See you next week. And by the way, next week we go to one hour instead of half an hour. Thanks to our sponsors, our great crew. I'm Jeremy Cordo. Believe in yourself and goodbye for now. Keep a dream in your pocket. Keep a dream in your heart. Keep your dream.